Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to go through um, the series of slides that we've got now. This is webinar number nine about brewing the West Coast, perfect West Coast IPA. So, um, first of all, I want to go through some history, um, how IPAs were created in the UK, and then how the resurgence in the US started um, in the 80s. So, we'll talk about that a little bit. Then, I want to talk about what West Coast IPA is, um, what exactly is it. We'll go through a few styles because there are a number of styles. Uh, then talk specifically about what ingredients you need to make them these really uh, big hoppy IPAs. And then finally finish off with how we take that beer through the brewing process. So history. Back in the late 1700s, early 1800s, um, British were on the Indian subcontinent and they sent colonists across there and they sent soldiers across there. And the soldiers were drinking a local uh, drink called Arak, which was made from palm sugar. And this was apparently quite tasty and quite strong, but uh, it was blinding people and it was killing people. So the UK government issued an order uh, to the brewers and to the East India Company and said, look guys, we need a good, strong, tasty ale that people are gonna enjoy in India. Um, it needs to be heavily hopped because it needs to get all the way down the Atlantic and back up the Indian Ocean to India, and it needs to be in specific barrels, which were oak barrels. Just so happened that a couple of miles up river, the River Thames from the East India Company, we were doing all the kind of good shipment between the UK and India. Uh, there was a brewery called Hodgson's, and so George Hodgson started brewing his pale ale, it wasn't called India Pale Ale at that point, um, to these uh, specific requirements um, that the UK government had set out, and he did that between 1750 and 1820. And he kept that business mainly because he was flexing prices to keep everyone else out. He had quite generous credit terms for the East India Company, and that kind of worked quite well for quite a while. However, 1820, 1821, I think he was kind of looking to get more profit into the business, despite the fact he'd had it all that time. And he started changing his terms. And so one of the chaps from the British government and the East India Company went up to Burton-on-Trent and they spoke to all sorts of brewery. Um, they actually had some of the Hodgson's Pale Ale with them. They said, guys, do you think we can brew this? And they had a look and they started to brew in 1822. And then, very far behind that, Salt Brewery and Bass Brewery were making India Pale Ale as well. And this is when they actually started getting called India Pale Ales. The opinion of the people um, in India when they tasted the beer uh, from Burton was that it had a superior flavor. Um, it was crisper, cleaner, it finished better, so it was better drinkability and the clarity was much better. And that was mainly because the burnt water, with its high sulfate content and its high calcium content, actually provided this flavor and this clarity. Um, so it really was down to the water. And that's why burnt became famous for, for making India pale ales. Sadly, towards the end of the 1800s, uh, the beginning of the 1900s, there were uh, numerous tax changes in the UK and the brewers, to keep the margins, uh, started making the beer weaker. And that made them less portable. They couldn't make it all the way to India. And by that point, there were a number of brewers in Northern India uh, that were actually making pale ales in any case. Um, so that kind of side of the business declined. We still have some pale ales here in the UK, uh, India pale ales indeed, but they're very much weaker. 3.6, 3.9, So that classic India Pale Ale style was lost. Interestingly, despite the fact it was called an India Pale Ale, the most IPA that went to any country was to the US. And that's quite an interesting fact. 
And what happened, there were some brewers up in the northeast, northeastern states, in New England and New York State, that were already making English style beers, or making porters, milds, uh, and various ales. And once they got a taste of this India Pale Ale and did a bit of work around water chemistry, they started making some really good coffees. That carried on, they had quite a lot of success with it. Um, and the thing that kind of slowed it down with these big ale breweries, there were two things really. There was the recession and prohibition. And there was also a burgeoning kind of growth of the American style lager, which was much more drinkable, less hoppy. And that was kind of starting to take over. And so all but a couple of the breweries had gone by the kind of 1930s. One that did survive was Ballantine's. Uh, that was going right up until 1971, and they made a really good IPA. Uh, they had a set of oak vats in their cellars, and they would age that beer for maybe a year. And they had a fairly unique process in terms of how they dry hopped. They'd take the hops they wanted to dry hop with, um, then they would distill out the hop oils in alcohol, and then put that into the casks, into vats, and then produce it from there. That was quite a unique process, which I don't think many people are doing now. I'd be interested to dig out that information and maybe try it. Bit of a gap then. Um, Sierra Nevada and Anchor Breweries uh, on, the, on the West Coast started making a really nice hoppy pale ale. Um, so uh, that was purportedly using the Ballantine yeast and they were using Cascade as a dry hop in the early 80s. So that will come back to Cascade as a hop, one of the first really kind of citrusy hops. And uh, we'll talk about that later. But that really was the beginning of the US IPA craze because those were quite hoppy, they were quite, they were dry hops, they were hop forward and that started to make a difference. As time went on, other breweries on the West Coast started to emulate the style, and um, the Yakima Brewery uh, that Bert Grant owned uh, actually did call it an India Pale Ale. I think it was that, that was 1983 when that happened. That's a picture there of the Ballantines label. Next kind of development was the beginning of the kind of hop craze. So Brewers started almost competing to see who would get the biggest, boldest beer. Um, they were banging more hops in there, more dry hop, increasing the strength. And as thing, time went on, there were more and more interesting hops coming along. So there were piney hops, there were tropical fruit aroma hops. These all started to play a part in that particular style. And off the back of that, these, these bigger and bigger ABV uh, came the double and uh, uh, imperial IPAs. Um, I think the classic there would be Pliny the Elder uh, from Russian River Brewery, but there were many others too. Founders then launched the All Day IPA, I think in the early 2000s. Um, so that, Jim, was that about 4 or 5% ABV? Yeah, it's a wonderful, really drinkable beer. Yeah, uh, yeah. So just not, not, maybe not quite so bitter, I guess, yeah? Right. Yeah, so it had more balance. Okay, good. Um, the one thing not to doubt is that the bigger American IPAs continue to be popular right across the US and indeed around the world now. Um, a lot of people are trying to emulate this style of the West Coast IPA. And through you know, over the last probably 10 years, there have been a few interesting uh, developments. There's been the black IPAs, uh, they've come and gone. Uh, and I think now Jim was saying yesterday when we had a chat, they're back again. Yeah, um, they're making a little bit of a resurgence. Uh, uh, yeah. I think it's, it's an interesting thing to play around with because you bring some of that multi depth and, and that might, you know, that astringency can maybe go with the hops as well. So, and a few people start basically brewed a regular brew, but then put some Belgian yeast in it. It brings that spiciness and that depth. So, that's another interesting thing. And then in 2003, I think I'm right on this, Jim, Alchemist Brewery released Heady Topper, um, which was almost the opposite of the big, aggressive, hoppy IPA. It was juicy. Um, whilst there was lots of hop aroma, there wasn't very much bitterness. Uh, and that was a different style altogether. So the kind of West Coast IPA term came back, kind of disappeared, 
and then it would come back just to differentiate between these two styles. That's a bit of history. There's Pliny the Elder, so that's that big double IPA we talked about. So, the West Coast IPA technically was an IPA that was brewed on the western coast of the US, right down the western seaboard. Uh, and it's the term that's been used for hopping American IPAs to distinguish it from those brewed on the east coast. Because like we said, those are quite different in style. Um, they can be English style, like we've just talked about on the history there. So that's where they're quite hot forward, a lot of bitterness, not so much aroma, maybe aged in oak barrels. Then there's the US Contemporary, so that's the West Coast IPAs essentially, that began in the 80s. And then going through into the 90s and noughties, there were double IPAs, black IPAs, and some of the Belgian IPAs. Did you ever try one of the Belgian IPAs, Jim? Were they were they interesting? Yeah, um, they're they're lovely. You get the spiciness from the yeast, and then uh, just the the nice offsetting bitterness from it. Mm -hmm. They they still pop up quite a bit from time to time. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's just getting the yeast. It's a slightly different process, but like you say, it does bring a lot of personality to the Belgian. Yeah. So, as we said earlier in the history, these were originally created on the Western seaboard um, from the early 80s, and they're still produced now. Uh, I think Sculpin IPA, uh, which isn't produced on the West Coast, in actual fact. Where's that produced, Jim? San Diego. Uh, so that's in San Diego. Yeah. Um, that is still in the top 10 beers in the US, um, as is um, Pliny the Elder. So they're still very popular styles, with lots and lots of bang for your buck. Really good flavor. Um, the one thing that kind of stopped the kind of West Coast terminology for a wee while was the fact that Green Flash Brewery um, in San Francisco, is it? Yeah. Uh, no, in San Diego as well. That's in San Diego too. Yeah, well, yeah. they actually trademarked the term West Coast IPA. So then we started calling it American IPA. But now we had to bring in that definition and that difference again. Okay, so let's look at what a contemporary West Coast IPA should look like and what it should taste like. So quite strong in bitterness, complex, dank, grassy aromas. So, Jim, can you maybe talk us through this? You've probably tasted more than I have in terms of how that comes across. Um, yeah, the um, especially the, the dank part uh, is not like your basement dank. Um, we're looking at more marijuana flavors there um, and aromas. Um, the grassy, I think, maybe kind of more of the classic bygone style and is hitting more on, um, I, I prefer the, the piney, almost pine forest, wonderful mm -hmm. gin and tonic um, kind of flavors and aromas, yeah. um, but lime and tropical as well. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. So quite a high final gravity on these. Uh, we'll go through some specifications in the next few slides. Um, but you need that for the balance. Uh, there's a lot of it in us there. So you need that for balance and you also need for body, which is quite important. I think initially, um, certainly Sierra Nevada and Anchor Brewery were adding, uh, looking at the records, kind of crystal caramel malts or maybe some Munich malt, uh, just to get some multi depth there. Uh, they may well have been using kind of US two or six round guessing, Jim. Would that be the case? Yeah, and and now there there seems to be the growing division of whether any caramel malts or Munich malts belong in a West Coast IPA, and that has been a fun discussion amongst brewers and uh, an interesting distinction between the the um, styles that they're brewing. Mm. Uh, that's interesting, yeah, because I, I think we've had this discussion in, in previous where we about how much difference a base malt can make. Um, right. And if you choose the right one um, and, and taste them beforehand, then you can deliver the right base to build these hops on, which is quite important. Should be quite a lot of fruity aroma. Uh, that's from dry hopping. We'll talk about that later. And that's these wonderful hops, um, wonderful US hops. Enormous amounts of aroma compared to hops from other parts of the world. Finishes long on bitterness, so quite a long bit of linger, and then it should finish quite dry and crisp. And that's really from the water chemistry. It's not from the, the way it's fermented, because as we say in point two there, 
uh, which has quite a fire, quite a high final gravity. This this is just the, the bit the salts in, in, in the water, so making a difference on your palate in terms of perception. And as we've said, completely different to the East Coast IPAs. In actual fact, the balance of sulfate and chloride on an East Coast IPA is exactly the opposite of a West Coast. Um, there's twice as much chloride to sulfate um, in an East Coast. And there's twice as much sulfate to chloride in the West Coast. Um, and those generally tend to be quite murky too. Um, I think my experience, I've not brewed many, but I, I, I'm guessing they're using wheat and um, oats and that, Jim. Yeah, yep, yep, lots of oats. No. Lots of yeah. I mean, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Enjoyment that is available. Okay, so quickly go through these, quite a lot of information. Uh, I won't read that completely. Uh, it's all there for you to see. We're in the sort of 5 to 7% alcohol by volume range and 35 to 63 bitterness units. And that would be pretty much emulating the English style at the time. I'll go to deep copper in colour, medium to high flowery hop aroma, quite a hot, strong hot flavour. So this is where you're going to put in the hops in mid-boil, let's say, or maybe in the whirlpool rather than in dry hop. So you get some flavour there. This should be quite malty and have a good, quite a strong body, a fairly yeah, medium body. Fruity esters should be there. Um, the one thing that always takes me to fruity esters. I used to brew bass, uh, bass for export. They used to come to the US actually. Um, and that particular uh, yeast gave lots and loads of really, really nice fruity esters. And I imagine that would have been quite good in this style. And like we talked about, one of the important things about English style is this aging in the battle. It seems to make a difference. And certainly back in the day, I don't think it's the same case now, the stuff that was getting delivered to India did have a slightly tart finish. It was quite acidic. Uh, and they found many years later when we had microscopes and people could isolate yeast, that there was Brettanomyces, um, a wild yeast that was living in the barrels, despite the fact that they'd been cleaned. This stuff was maybe three or four millimeters into the wood. So it wasn't getting killed and that started to bring a certain personality. So that might be something interesting if you want to brew one of these is get some barrels and try and get a bit of a, a population of microflora in there that gives these different flavors. I've had a, a few uh, Brett IPAs that have been really, really great, uh, yeah. really nice complexity. But we've gone the opposite uh, direction now, and it seems to be, you know, within one month is a sweet spot for consumption. And then, uh, you know, by about three months, it's getting a little dodgy. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? It just yeah. keeps on going and it gets, it takes, the bread can just keep fermenting. That's the danger. Of it. It's, it's a diastatic yeast and so it can just keep fermenting away and then that makes it dry and unpleasant. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. So these are the West Coast IPAs essentially. Uh, now American IPAs, but it's these big, bold bitterness, 50 to 70 IBUs. Slightly stronger than ABV. Similar color, lots more flowery hop around on this. Um, the US hops really made a big difference um, and do have quite a strong hop flavor too. So, a medium maltiness and body, similar to the English style. Probably stronger on the fruity esters, depending which yeast you choose. We'll talk about that in a wee while. And this is where we get these wonderful aromas. So there's the citrusy hops, there's the piney ones that Jim mentioned, there's tropical fruit now. Um, and then I think some of the brewers you were saying yesterday, Jim, are starting to use like New Zealand hops and stuff like that, yeah? Yeah, New Zealand is great. Um, a lot of people are blending uh, hops now to really kind of focus in on those aromas and, and flavors. Uh, BSG just released HS 1228, uh, which is exactly like just um, I think it does a really nice job of meeting the classic piney um, kind of like the the darker lime fruits um, mm. but then tickles the fancy of the uh, the newer IPA drinker with the tropical aromas and flavors oh, wow. that yeah. sounds like a really good hole yeah. yeah excellent okay so 
we talked about this kind of hot race where people are making things bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's become a style now. Uh, it's either called an imperial or a double IPA. So we're now in the realms of kind of 10% plus. Um, you know, that in the UK would be kind of barley wine kind of strength. Bitterness can go right up to 100 IBU. Really intense hot bitterness, lots of flavor. But the key thing with this is that the aroma should be fresh and lively. So it's about using really, really fresh hops. Um, because if not, that will bring a harshness, which we'll talk about in a wee while when we talk about hop additions. Alcohol content, medium to high, obviously. Um, and it should be notably evident. You know, so you might have some higher alcohols in there as well. Uh, and those will bring flavor uh, and aroma to the beer as well. Um, I'm guessing you've tried a few of these, Jim. Um, is it quite warming when you drink it? Is it kind of down here kind of thing? They do. I like them on the lighter end. Uh, the doubles that get a little big for me, they um, sometimes with the malt presence offsets with a little bit of sweetness. Mm -hmm. And since I'm more of a, uh, I don't know, I guess I, I lean more towards the uh, classic styles. I like them dry and, um, mm -hmm. and, and easy to drink. But um, yeah, right around the seven, eight, nine percent. They're, they're pretty nice. Yeah. Cool. Sounds good. Yeah. So similar in color, quite deep golden. You won't get any particularly pale styles in this category because of the amount of malt that's going in there. And it's actually quite a long mash as well, which we'll talk about afterwards. And you've got these complex alcohol flavors and lots of fruity esters. So Pliny of the Elders, the classic on that. And people... I wasn't able to scrape up any Pliny before. The... Yeah, I understand it's quite, uh, yeah, quite difficult to get a hold of. <laughs> Okay, so we did talk briefly about black IPAs. Um, so these are still pretty punchy on bitterness, 50 to 70. Similar ABV range to a West Coast, you know, the pale stuff. So quite a high bitterness, flavor and aroma. Medium to high alcohol content. So quite a medium body on that as well, because you can have more malt. I'm guessing the hops would be what, like fruity, floral, and maybe some herbal stuff coming in, Jim. What kind of hop would you use for that? Um, actually, a lot of the same that you use for your West Coast style. Um, I think it just, on some versions, you get just a touch of roastiness um, from some of the darker malts. Um, yeah. But it's, it's kind of like enjoying a nice um, cup of coffee in the morning uh, in a pine forest. It's, yeah. uh, it's fire. Yeah. It wakes you up. I like it. That's good. <laughs> so, yeah, there is caramel malt, there's dark roasted malt in there. And that needs to be balanced because th these are some of the stuff from the BGCP, BJCP guidelines, by the way. Um, and they're saying that that real harsh astringent, that ashiness that you can get from roasted barley, from black patent malt, uh, shouldn't really be there. And there are some malts you can use to avoid that, which we'll talk about later. So Green Flash do a, a version of that at the moment. Is that still in circulation or are they still making it, Jim? Um, I haven't seen that one for a while. They, oh. they may be on a limited release. Maybe so. Maybe so. Yeah. Okay. So, ingredients. Extra pale malt. I think that's fairly fundamental. That needs to be in there. Um, from what I read, and maybe you can confirm this, Jim, um, you're doing... English and the Imperial IPAs, it should uh, really be an English extra pale malt, maybe like Maris Alto or, or, or Chevalier, just because you've yeah. got that multi depth and sweetness. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. The, um, when uh, you guys have released the uh, Plumage Archer, I really liked that one as mm -hmm. well. The, the presence of that was really nice. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're, we're hoping for quite a good harvest of Plumage Archer this year. So. A bit of luck, we'll get some more. So that's good news. Yeah. Um, like we mentioned earlier, and maybe there's some discussion about this in the US at the moment, Munich and low color crystal can uh, give sweetness and multi depth. That depends on where the palette's going, I guess it depends on your preference. Um, for the black IPAs, there are, um, I think there's just one patented product from Viaman um, that is dehusked roasted barley. Um, or you can use an extract 
I think they call it cinema. Um, and I think some people could even use caramel if they wanted just to get the colour. I think that will have an impact on the flavour and the balance of the beer. Mm. IPAs are all about dryness and about bitterness being forward. So using calcium sulfate will accentuate bitterness and give a dry feeling to the palate. And then using calcium chloride actually gives fullness. So using those two compounds in your water as you're brewing, or like you mix them through your mash and then mash in, um, will give you these that, that nice finish that you'd be looking for in an IPA. And as I mentioned earlier, sulfate to chloride ratio should be around two to one. And I think that's part of maybe why um, it's evolved into different areas in uh, on the West Coast in the warmer climate of Southern California or kind of inland, having not such a um, malty or a caramely presence makes it more drinkable. You get to enjoy the hop aroma uh, with the malt presence. Um, but maybe as the climate gets a little cooler, a little wetter, uh, maybe you want a little bit more of that substance to kind of, you know, offset the dreariness a little bit. So yeah, you can allow for, for Munich and, and crystal malts. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Interesting. Yeah, like you say that, I never, never thought of that. Obviously, that was something that we thought, thought about way back when this style started, you know, never sent it to India. That dryness and that refreshment was probably quite important. Yeah, that's good. And the calcium helps the, the uh, yeast precipitate as well, right? So yeah. clarity clarity is important. None of this hazy nonsense. <laughs> this is it, quite right. That's how I would talk as a bit of it as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mentioned uh, oak earlier, and it seems certainly for the English style and the English stuff that was being made, that oak from the Baltic states was best. It's got a much tighter grain which I guess won't let quite so much of that bacteria and wild yeast penetrate into it. Um, so that's why I think that particular type of it was used and specified by the UK government all those years ago. So we'll talk about hops a little bit. Um, Cascade, I guess, was one of the first ones. It was released commercially in 1972. And uh, it really did take a wee while to catch on. I think, uh, Coors decided to take a little bit, um, and I think the farm was kind of sharing out rhizomes to other farmers, just trying to get some, some energy behind it. And what really kind of helped it take off was when Fritz Maytag uh, from Anchor Brewery decided to use it in the Liberty Ale. So this is one of the first pale ales that we talked about earlier on. And as the craft brew movement took hold, um, the breeders were making more citrusy hops. Um, there were the four C's, so now, to so remember these, Cascade, Centennial, Chinook, and what's the other one? I can't remember. Columbus. That's it, Columbus, Columbus. yeah. Because yeah. the four C's were really kind of big in the 80s and 90s, like right up to the naughty. In actual fact, Cascade's still around 10% of the US hop production. I yeah. brewed with it in the UK. Um, you know, quite a bit of it went into Duma, which is the UK's most popular uh, Cascade, and it's fabulous really really nice well i think Fuggle is one of the parents of cascade right so yeah it's kind of tying it back to the the old world ipas yeah indeed yeah that's right yeah that's how that happened so aroma on this floral citrus but quite prominently grapefruit um the alpha acid contents four and a half to 8.9 so that big um quite a high beta acid content too cohumulone is like one of the parts of the alpha acid, and it's quite an important one. Um, so that's 33 to 40%. You don't want too much cohumulone, you know, I'll come on to that. And then all content's fairly average on that, um, but good percentage of mercy. And mercy is one of the more important uh, elements of hop oils. Um, so it's that quite high on the cascade. Centennial came next. Um, it was actually, ah, oh, there you go, he said, we did get it right. Um, that was dubbed a super cascade. Uh, so that parentage is Fuggles, Brewers Rolls, East Cake Rollings, uh, released in 1990. And then we have the Four Seas. I'm not sure what the parentage of Shinnok and Columbus were. Were they just 
further developments of Centelli and Cascade, Jim? Yeah, I, I believe so. Yeah, so they've been crosses from that. Uh, uh. So this had a bit more earthy aroma, still had the floral layer, but more citrusy. A bit bigger on alpha acid, but much less beta acid. Lower core humulone, improved or higher hot oil content, but not quite as much nursing. So this is kind of a way the breeders were going. They were trying to keep the core humulone and the beta acid as low as possible. And we'll come on to why in a minute. American IPAs are about US hops and showcasing those. And I think now they've kind of gone through that, they will try hops from um, the Southern Hemisphere, which are also quite interesting too. But it's about that aroma, it's about the dry hopping. And like I mentioned, the hop breeders will try and select on their breeding with the lowest possible levels of core you know, because above 30%, they can create a kind of harsh bitterness. It's a bit unpleasant. And high levels of beta acids can be a problem too, because whilst they're not soluble in water and beer themselves, what happens as the hops sit in the hop store, uh, be it cold or warm, uh, they will start to oxidize. I know now that hops are like packaged in the nitrogen and then vac packed and so on. But I think anything that's kind of got some age on it or it's been opened and left in the back of the hop store, you don't use it very often would have higher levels of these beta acid oxidization products. And those are soluble in beer and will give a really harsh, horrible bitterness. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind when you're making these styles. Um, there's a few examples there of hops I'm sure you've all heard of. A lot of these are um, proprietary hops. So you know, not everyone can sell them. I think even in the UK now, uh, some of the hop merchants are selling these because Yakima are selling them direct to the breweries in the UK now. Um, but they are really lovely aromas and I pretty much, you know, they're, they're the popular ones, Jim, yeah? Um, yeah, it, it kind of seems like it's, um, it, it goes the gamut on what the brewer's trying to accomplish. We've even seen like a resurgence of some of the classic varieties coming back up as picking windows for hops change, um, as climate changes a little bit. Um, we've seen like one of my, I, I think I'm gonna maybe catch some guff for this one, but one of my favorite examples of that has been uh, Nugget over the last couple of years. Um, kind of faded away into obscurity and uh, the last couple of years, the aroma and flavor of that hop has been just out of this world. Yeah. Yeah, but but even um, you know with with the classics like Centennial, I, I think it's coming down now to um, kind of terroir and where it's grown, how it's grown, mm -hmm. and you get those vibrant, fruity aromas. Um, yeah, from farmers that are taking care of those varieties. That's good. Yeah, and I think that the more we can do that, I've been a big proponent and champion of this for a long, long time. The more we can talk about terroir uh, with the ingredients that we use in beer and give it that different level of interest and complexity and start food pairing and all these kind of things, I think that's really important to get beer where it should be uh, in terms of price and in terms of how people enjoy it. Um, so that talking about that kind of thing um, is really interesting. It's something we're working on in terms of mold. You know, where is it grown? Why is that important? What's the soil like? What's the, what's the climate like? So, Really interesting. Yeah. Okay. So we'll talk about, about hop selection now. So we co on below 30%, like I said. So this is what you guys should be looking at when you're going to buy hops. Um, beta acid should be as low as possible. And all these things are seasonal. So whilst a variety will have a fairly fixed kind of quantity of these things, it will vary from season to season. So it's worth checking this out before you commit to buying. Fresh as possible hops. Like I said, that's really important so we don't get beta acid oxidation products. Um, keep in mind that the longer the hops are boiled for, the more of that alpha acid isomerizes. And isomerization of alpha acids is what we perceive as bitterness. They change shape and then they latch onto our bitterness sensors on our tongues. So the earlier in the boil you get those hops, the more bitterness 
you actually get measurable bitterness too. Keep in mind that higher gravity works don't tend to give as much isomerization, so you get less utilization of the alpha acids. And also, they're about 30% of the calculator bitterness that you put in the brew house can be lost. And indeed, I guess if you're using a calculation, dry hopping and maybe trying to factor in these acids or whatever, 30% of that is lost. It kind of adheres to the yeast. I don't really understand the chemistry and biology of it, but it does, it comes out with the yeast. Uh, which is why you couldn't really take some yeast from a brew and give it to a baker and make bread with it because it tastes horrible because it's bitter. Um, so that's quite an interesting thing to keep in mind. And there doesn't seem to be a, a linear relationship between how much hops you put in and what bitterness you get out of the other end. So there is a finite limit to how much hop you can put in and the bitterness you can achieve. So, so don't just keep adding it and adding it because you're wasting your money and it's not going to have any, any impact really on Certainly on bitterness, but it may well be on our own. Um, and that will be the dry hop. We're, oh, we're seeing, ten. Go on, Jim. Oh, that, uh, we're seeing um, also a distinction with uh, when you're using, especially hop pellets, how those uh, pellets are um, pelletized and the quality of the compaction and density of those pellets. Um, in the kettle, it doesn't really seem to matter. Uh, you know, you're boiling them and mm -hmm. you're getting integration there. But when you're dry hopping, you want to make sure that you're using hops that are, they're not uh, complete fluff, um, but they break apart fairly easily in the fingers. Um, and you can often do tests in your beer um, where if you're, or a lot of people, a lot of brewers know this already, if they're dry hopping and you're pouring the pellets in the tank and you uh, hear them ting, uh, you know, in the fermenter all the way down that maybe the uh, density of those may be a little too high for yeah. uh, for dry hopping. So if you're seeing glassy exteriors um, or they're very, very hard, maybe use those in the kettle. But if you have a reputable vendor that has a nice, uh, yeah, it's, it's almost velvety on the exterior. Hmm. Um, those are great for dry hopping. Yeah, because they'll break up. Yeah, that's good. That's a really good tip, actually. That's great. Yeah, thank you for that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about brewing. Um, so with a mash, vertinize the water. So that's the calcium sulfate, calcium chloride, maybe a bit of magnesium sulfate too. Uh, but be careful with magnesium. If it's above 20 ppm, it can get quite harsh. Um, you need a well-modified malt because you're looking for a good deal of um, fermentability there, and preferably made from the two-row barley. And if you're doing a double or an imperial IPA, um, it seems to be the thing that you would use an English one uh, that's gonna be a little bit more malty. Um, so Maris Otter is a classic, and Chevalier that we brought back from the seed bank was the original um, malt or barley variety that was used in IPAs at the time. Um, so if you want to be really true to style and authentic, then Chevalier is the one. And it is incredible stuff. It really is very tasty and complex. The, and the extra pale Maris Otter has become pretty popular here mm. on the West Coast as well. So you're getting that, that full malt presence um, as well as the, the lighter color, for the, especially for the Southern California style. All right, okay. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Really. You've got, like you say, you've got the flavor, but you've not got too much color, so that's good. Um, mashing between 63 and 64C uh, for a regular IPA um, is about right. And I'll probably say a liquid juice ratio of like 2.7 to 1. And a 60 minute stand is more than adequate. You're going to convert everything. It's all malt at the end of the day. Um, so there's no issue with conversion and getting a nice fermentable wort. Um, for the Dublin Imperial IPAs that are gonna finish nine, 10, 10 and a half percent, you need to buy them a little bit lower just to increase that fermentability. And leaving them for a little longer um, does actually help that conversion and the fact that you're gonna make more simple sugars that the yeast can ferment out. Going back in the day, um, they used to mash for quite a long time. I did a, a brew with the Chevalier with a guy called Shane Swindells from Cheshire Brewhouse. And we mashed that for three hours. 
um, at 64, I think it was. Uh, but that's, that was the way it was done in Burton, so you kind of wanted to stay true to the style of how they did it there. We actually boiled it for three hours as well. Well, we did boil it, we simmered it, which was quite interesting. <laughs> that was mainly for colour. We're, so we're seeing a lot of uh, dextrin malt in, in the West Coast styles too, so they, they oh, don't yeah. get too dry. Um, and it's it, it, it helps balance it out a little bit as well. Yeah, that gives a bit of audit. Yeah, yeah. I suppose that's important because obviously you know, there's only so much you can do with mash temperature, and after that, you just need to supplement with some uh, some dextrin malt that's going to fix those sugars, uh, and they're not going to be too fermentable. Yeah, that's true. Um, it seems from the literature um, that fresh grown hops are best, um, but the trouble with fresh grown hops is they don't last forever, um, but despite how well they're packaged. Um, so. I guess there's been some debate about that too, Jim, in the US. Yeah, um, we we have the the fresh hop style that comes around um, in the late summer and, and early autumn. Mm -hmm. um, but then we have some brewers as well that like the kilned uh, version. So the fresh hop, the hops come right out of the field and mm -hmm. go straight into the brew house, and that's, I mean, it's incredibly expensive to ship. Um, you're using a lot of hops because those it, all the, the hop mm. material still has all the water in it. Um, yeah, but some of the brewers uh, are using the fresh hops out of the kiln. So they've been picked, but kilned, but then not processed beyond that. And then they use them in the brew house. Well, okay. So it's kind of the mid range between what we call wet hop beers um, and then into the fresh hop. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's good to know. That's good to know. Uh, Tag ninety pellets, um, standard offering from most of the hot merchants. I know some of my customers in the UK now are just are having conversations with the UK um, hot farmers, and when they go in and checking the samples on farm, and they're getting the, the the hops that they like, they're asking the merchants and the processors to process them into type forty five pellets. Um, they're not that common, um, but I think there's more and more people getting interested in them. And the beauty of that is that there's only 45% of the vegetable material in a Type 45 and 90% of the vegetable material in a Type 90. So the amount of hop aroma, oils, all the lupulin gland stuff um, in a Type 45 is higher, which means you don't have to put as much in, which means you're not going to get a high as, as higher beer loss when you're putting those dry hops into the fermentation tank and into the conditioning tank, and that's going to save money. And I imagine, going back to what Jim said about the, uh, the type of hop pellet, certainly type 45 that I've seen and worked with are softer, and, and, and there's not as much fed material in there, so and that yeah. might work well. 60 million oil is generally enough. Um, I personally would add hops, begin the boil, maybe 20 minutes in, after boiling in kettle, and then everything else either in the whirlpool or a hot back if you have one, and preferably in work below 85 degrees. So circulate that through the heat exchange, you get it down to 85, then put your really nice aroma hops in there. Does that sound about right, Jim? Yeah, um, we're also seeing a lot of people using the CO2 extract for the uh -huh. boil. Um, that further increases yields and really delivers a nice clean bitterness as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the beauty of it because, you know, you're not going to get that kind of aged oxidized character that you can get with some of the older hops. It kind of yeah. fixed it and that's that. And similar with the cryo stuff, isn't it? It's quite good stuff. Yeah. It, it's a really nice trick. And it, when CO2 or, or maybe when craft was kind of kicking off a little bit more, I think a, a lot of, a lot of brewers were reluctant to embrace the CO2 extract. Um, but the ones that did kind of did so quietly, um, but mm -hmm. saw a lot of success with it. And I think it's becoming more acceptable as different hot products become prevalent in the, in the market, but it's, um, it's a really tried and true method. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's good yeah. to know. Yeah, glad. Yeah. Certainly the UK craft is a bit cautious about it. So that's good to hear. Um, and, and we'll certainly spread that, spread the word. Yeah. As I mentioned, uh, back in the day in Burton, they were simmering, simmer boiling for three to four hours, but that wasn't really about isomerization. It was more about keeping the color as low as possible, but they were still pale. Fermentation, um, 
biotransformation is a big thing um, at, at the moment. Um, so some yeasts have high levels of a, an enzyme called beta glucosidase. And this enzyme kind of breaks up some of the hot components and makes more aroma. Um, so the chemistry is quite complex. It's in Mitch Steele's book. It's in some of the other brewing texts. Um, so have a look at that and try and choose a yeast that is, uh, is, is high in levels of that beta glucosidase. Um, the should be an ale strain. Um, and it just so happens that the West Coast strains have got lots of beta glucosidase and they're not too high in ester production. So they're ideal. Uh, I think Lalamon for you guys using um, dry packet yeast, um, the BRY97 is a good example of that type of yeast that can do that. It's important to make sure that certainly if you're using wet yeast, there's enough oxygen there to get sufficient growth at the beginning of fermentation to have the biomass and the energy there to finish the fermentation, from that fermentation off the end. And looking at the recommendations, like a million cells per mil per degree plateau is about right. Um, so for example, a 1048 out of 12 plateau beer should have 12, 12 million cells per mil. Um, and I know some of the UK brewers don't always have a microscope in the corner to look through. And I think that's important because when you get to this level, you're trying to get that consistency and that flavor, knowing what you're pitching and making sure it's alive is really, really important. So it's a good investment having a microscope and a hemocytometer to do the counting and the counting chain. The other thing is just keep an eye on temperature because stressing yeast out, stressing yeast out can cause it to um, produce more esters and other off flavors. Uh, and similarly, if it's not warm enough, then you're not going to get sufficient yeast growth and you can end up with diacetyl and all sorts of other problems. So making sure that that sweet spot where, we, where the yeast is growing um, and producing enough to finish the fermentation is quite important. So the last slide, we'll talk about dry hopping. So you can tie hot, hot cones in bags or pairs of tights or whatever you like, and then tie them into the tank. You need to tie them down so they don't float, because otherwise they don't really get inside the beer and give all that lovely aroma up. Uh, but it's much easier to be honest to just get some T45 or T90 pellets. So I, I tended to slurry those up in hot liquor because it took away that risk, or it seems to take away that risk of, of hot creep, uh, and then put those in the tank and then put the beer on top. Or you can inject it on the way between condition, uh, fermentation tank and conditioning tank if you have that uh, flexibility and that capacity. Um, but slurrying them up in hot liquor, not boiling water, but hot liquor, does seem to help with hot creep. But a lot of uh, West Coast craft brewers are, are just putting them in Right through the port in the top. Right, yep. So that's, yep. that's, that's good as well. And they don't get particular issues with hot creep. There's no major problem with that. It comes up occasionally, um, but a lot of brewers have managed to account for it in their process. Or I guess. Yeah, or yeah. other varieties just don't see it as much. Um, it it kind of it's variety dependent. It seems yeah, like. that is, I think it's about managing your process. I mean, I was thinking that, Jim, when you were talking about the hot pellets and the fact that, you know, the softer ones, the more velvety ones, they probably not had as much heat treatment, which means that maybe there's more alpha and beta amylase potentially in those pellets, which could kind of lead to the hot creep. But I think if you're adding them at the right time, then it's not too bad. I think we'll come on to that in a minute, actually. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, the, the sweet spot that people think people seem to find is the best place to add it is adding them as the fermentation is kind of finishing. So you've still got quite a bit of temperature there. There's a, quite lots of yeast um, still active. And um, you're putting the beer on crash cold, so it's achieved its final gravity. Putting the hops in then seems to help with the hop creep thing. And it seems to give you the best in terms of hop aroma and flavor. Yeah? Right, yep, yep. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. I mean, one thing that this, this, this recent studies have shown that the actual flavor extraction, the aroma extraction, only takes two to three days. So what you could do is kind of put one really lovely, like 
aromatic hopping for the first batch, drop that off and then put another batch in. Uh, and then you're going to get these different flavors and these layers of complexity and aroma, which make the beer a lot interesting and drinkable, I guess. And then you get to tell the customer double dry hunt. And they love it. Yep, <laughs> that's it. Perfect. Good. So I think that's us. Oh, yeah, hot cream. We just talked about that. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, I'll stop sharing now. And if there are any questions, then we'd we'll be lovely, uh, lovely to answer them. Thanks, guys. Fantastic as ever. So, yeah, so we've got a few questions coming in. Um, so, first one is around malt, and it's been touched on a bit here, uh, but a big shift has been to using less crystal. I think Jim mentioned that there. Um, um, so, sorry, sorry. Has there been a big shift to using less crystal malt in these West Coast styles? How do you kind of how do you produce a drier West Coast style that lets the hop shine through? Um, because some of them can be a bit overly sweet, writes the question asker. So, how do what kind of malts or what mashing techniques you would be using to mm -hmm. um, dampen down that sweetness and let the hops come through? Um, I think. A lot of people are um, going for the, the two-row base malt, generally um, 1.5 to 2 Lovabon. Um, depending on your take on it, you can have something that has a little more malt presence to it, like an extra pale Maris Otter. I've been really curious how the um, extra pale clear choice would be, um, uh, right. how that would react in IPA. I, I'm really interested in that. but. Um, you, yeah, like uh, extra pale and then really it's just um, embracing that, that dryness um, and going for one of the examples that I have here is uh, Green Cheeks with Pet the Tiger and this is, I mean, it, it's very, very light. There's no crystal mold in it whatsoever um, compared to the classic green flash west coast ipa oh that's a big difference yeah 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 so uh -huh. um so this the west coast ipa is kind of the more classic where you'll see some some crystal malt or some munich malt in there um but this one uh from this brewery green cheek uh evan evan price from uh formerly of noble and now uh owns his own brewery called green cheek is kind of pushing this California IPA uh, name to these okay. things where it, it takes out that extraneous malt and as light as possible. Um, you, you know, the, the mash is like 64, 65 C um, mm -hmm. and just uh, make sure you get a good boil to get all the uh, DMS out of there. And then, yes, indeed. Yep. And then follow your normal protocol for dry hopping and um, you know, maybe some whirlpool additions. To, to really hit that that back in aroma, but yeah, excellent, very good. Cheers, <laughs> cheers. The, bre the breakfast beer is out. Excellent, good yeah. work. Yeah. <laughs> well, will, will those beers that you've got there will they all be filtered, or will they be just drop right in tank? Majority just drop right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's impressive. Um, yeah. It kind of depends on the brewers equipment set up um but most of them i i believe just rely on findings cool so that brings us to the next question yeah what do you think about using findings after dry hopping these beers um i've had uh, this this the person writing the questions had bad experiences uh, you, uh losing a lot of aroma after using them um, although I think they're specifically referring to PVPP rather than the findings, but so what kind of um, filter aids or uh, brewing aid regimes would you have to drop that bright? Um, a lot of the times we're focusing just on the pro getting the proteins out of the beer. Um, so biofine, uh, some people are using gelatin, which also kind of uh, acts on some of the polyphenols as well. Biofine doesn't do as well with polyphenols. Um, but I think getting it as clear as possible and, you know, maybe not stripping out all the polyphenols, I, I equate IPA to kind of 
taking a walk through the forest, right? So uh, you can walk through bushes and brambles and underbrush, um, and that's like drinking a, a hazy IPA. You're, you're, not, you're not able to enjoy uh, your walk, but if you have a clear path down through the forest, you can enjoy the forest, and that's getting that beer um, as clear as possible. Maybe not 100% clear, um, but it's going to allow you to enjoy that experience uh, that really good malt and that those really good hops that you put in there. So, yeah, make a nice little path. It doesn't have to be a per perfect path. Um, <laughs> That's a great but, analogy. I really like yeah. it. Yeah. Excellent. Good stuff. Um, do you have any mash pH recommendations for West Coast IPAs? Are they, is it any different to, to any other style, ale styles, or any specifics around pH? Not really. Didn't find anything in the books about it. No. No, no in terms of yeah, so the, yeah. the water chemistry, you were just really talking about Burtonization. So we're w working under the assumption that uh, you're starting with relatively soft water just before you then Burtonize, I guess. But if you were in a hard water area, you're probably not going to have to do a huge amount of work. Is that fair to say? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, ideally, I would think somewhere like 5.2 would be the sweet spot. So yeah. 5.2 is point two. Regular water okay. pH really. So if, if if you have got a lot of um, alkalinity in the water, you know you can acidify the mashing liquor to try and get rid of some of that, mm -hmm. and then use the salts to get the right balance of calcium, chloride, sulfate. Yeah, water chemistry. Yeah, I, I think five point two to five point six. You know, like a normal. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's right where you should normally be. Okay. Yeah. And is the water chemistry and or the water profile in California quite common across the whole of the state, or does it vary quite a lot from area to area? It varies, and it can vary from day to day. Um, since we're pulling water from so many sources, reservoirs, mm -hmm. um, it, it's really important to manage your water, especially in California. Do lots of Californian brewers use RO, John? The ones that can afford it. Okay. Um, yeah. It's expensive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or, or they'll use partial RO um, and kind of deal with what we have. Yeah. 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 Very good. Okay. Um, there's one about hops here, specifically to do with UK hops, though. Um, so there's, a, there's um, some people growing US Cascade, but in the UK. Um, this person's growing it on their allotment in London. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Could I expect similar flavors um, with uh, growing it in the UK or given that it's completely different terroir, is it going to be very, very different? Um, I'm not a hop expert, <laughs> but I would think it would be pretty Charles different. Here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I think you're going to see a significant difference. Yeah. Um, we doing hop selection um, for the last handful of years now in Yakima. I mean, you have hops that have grown through the you know entire Pacific Northwest. You see differences in hops that are grown in Oregon, in Washington, and Idaho. And you're covering a lot of differences in sunlight exposure, soil types. Um, I, I really equate it to uh, wine grape growing. And you really start to see um, specific differences between certain growing regions. Um, we, I think we'd like to we used to like to focus on it being, you know, just consistent. It's, you know, it's Centennial, it's Cascade, it's Chinook. But I think we're moving more towards a, this is a Yakima Valley grown Chinook, or this is a uh, Idaho grown Amarillo, where it can really express some influence. It's really interesting. Yeah, so it's, it's almost like the, the oils and hops are analogous to the sugar profiles in in grapes really and depending on the minerality of the soil and the, the weather and the sunshine hours and all these sorts of things mm -hmm. it can have a major bearing on the flavor so so yeah there we go grown in london is probably going to be significantly different um, yeah. we've, we've dried up on questions there it was such a comprehensive okay. presentation if, we'll keep things open if anyone's got any more but my, my question was going to be what do you think is next in terms of um coming out of california so you mentioned that um that move towards a, a California IPA. Um, where, where do you think that's headed, Jim? Um, it seems to be continually going towards uh, less bitterness and more fruit forward flavors. Um, 
the new generation of drinkers seems to be very keen on lactose and uh, fruit additions. Uh, it's <laughs> um, yeah. even even uh, I don't know they're calling them sour IPAs is is a thing. Um, so I think we're in a brave new world. Um, I'm hoping. I really like the really low crystal um, or lo very low to no crystal IPA. I, cool. I think there's a lot of room for that. I think maybe as the younger drinkers' palates mature, we'll hold on to that style. Um, but there seems to be no escaping the haze. No, yeah, no escaping the haze. Indeed. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Um, one hey, question just popped in there. But I mean, uh, Pizza Port here has made uh, classic IPA. You know, they help establish the style, and it's very crisp. Um, I would say kind of moderate um, bitterness, and it's it's everywhere. Their their restaurants and breweries are always packed. It's such a good, refreshing beer. I, I don't ever see it. Um, going away but, yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so one question here um, someone asking many macro brewers I guess so the, the big guys in the UK we, we would refer to as the macro brewers are making this style so how do you think that will affect the flavor profile given the amount of ingredients being used I guess this person sort of assuming that the uh, the bigger guys are maybe watering things down a bit in terms of flavor do you think um, um, do you think it will affect the, the flavor profile? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think there's, oh, there's nice. such a huge, there's a huge difference between the UK and the US. Um, the, the biggest difference, I think, not just the availability of the freshness of hops, but is the ABV. Because your ABVs and you pay the duty, um, the same duty, no matter what the ABV is. Um, whereas in the UK, it's dependent on um, you, it's it's um, priced up per ABV points. Um, the, the US versions are always so much bigger and bolder than what we're able to than what I feel anyway that we're able to produce in the UK. And I think that's probably one of been the bigger sort of driving factors really for for having um, having that slightly more diluted profile in the UK. Do you think that's fair, Carl? Yeah, indeed. Yeah. And I think if the, if the big guys, you know, the, the sort of global brewers, the multinational brewers, do start experimenting and try and build big brands on it, it will be uh, the bitterness, the hops will be as low cost as possible, mm. and um, they may use hop oils rather than dry hopping because. Albeit they probably have got some capacity now because craft has kind of impinged on their on, on their dominance. Um, it does take a long time and it takes people. And you know, I worked in a big brewery in the UK and the, the whole operation and it was producing a lot of beer it was run by six guys, you know, um, and that was a big site. So you try throwing dry hopping into that and, and getting all these lovely juicy flavors and aromas and all that kind of thing. I think they'd struggle. I think so unless would. there's a really yeah. good product out there that they could use that gets that kind of aroma and flavor, I don't think they'll get anywhere. They might that's try and they might spend a lot of money on branding, but I'm not sure yeah, they'll ever get the flavor. The techniques. So, but that's I, great. I, mean, I think it's great that the, the bigger companies are embracing new styles all the time as well because it's simply I raising that people the public's awareness of the styles and um and then you know hopefully that also drives trade towards the craft brewers as well um yeah. i think I with the larger brewers um producing this it's going to be how they manage inventory um it you know with people not really enjoying these beers maybe after three months making sure that old inventory is rotated um through the yes. stores uh how it's stored if, if it's stored warm it doesn't fare as well um, and why I think craft has done a really good job with this style is it's a labor of love it does really well fresh um, and it, it it takes care to, to manage it and to present it really well um, yes. so if they can do that if they can use their economies of scale and their resources um, to do that 
uh, with the brands that they're putting out, I think they'll be successful. But if it just if it's just a normal commodity that they're putting out there, it, it's going to be a, a little tough road for them. Maybe tough so, sell. Yeah, quality yeah. always wins. I I believe so. Um, I think we'll finish up there. Thank you so much, Jim, for joining us. We're very jealous that you do live in California, close to all those, all those <laughs> fresh, dank hops, um, and that you've been cracking some beers there this morning. Um, so we'll, yeah, yeah, we'll leave it there. Um, we're back in a couple of weeks, and we're moving into distilling, actually, in two weeks' time. Um, so look out for information on the newsletter um, about that uh, topic that we're going to be covering, uh, which is going to be around about specialty malts in distilling. Um, so this webinar will be available online later on if you miss bits of it just go to chrismalt.com in the next few days and you'll be able to grab a copy there um, thanks again to Carl and to Jim and yeah thanks Jim we'll say goodbye thanks, and enjoy cheers mate <laughs> <laughs>